When I launched this channel, the first video I published was about getting started in weathering for model railroads. Now it's time for a second edition. So have you ever wanted to weather stuff on your model railroad, but you had no idea where to start? Well, I've got something to get you on the rails coming up now on GC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track, a place for advice and tips on adding realism to your model trains or modeling anything for that matter. So if you're looking for ways to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs on the rails today, click on subscribe and that little bell icon to receive a notification every time I upload a new video. So what kind of experience do you have when it comes to weathering? What parts of it do you find frustrating? What aspects do you enjoy? Let me know in the comments section below. Weathering stuff on your model railroad, be it rolling stock, locomotives, buildings, or pretty much anything else, can seem to be a little bit intimidating. I get it. But it is a rewarding part of the hobby. Still, there are a few things that might stand in your way of grunging up your locomotives and your rolling stock. First, you might not want to spoil the new factory paint job, possibly reducing its resale value. Second, you may not know where to start, or third, you've tried it and the pastels and chalk have just left your model looking dirty. From its start almost three years ago, I've dedicated this channel to taking the mystique out of both painting and weathering. Still, we all have to start somewhere, and I've built and painted models across several different genres, and I've picked up many tricks along the way. And even after operating this channel for almost three years, there are always new tips and tricks that I'm picking up and I'm dying to share with you. So here's a few things to keep in mind. I'm assuming at this point that if you're getting started, your starting point is a factory painted model. Some of my videos cover painting undecorated models. However, it's best to start with an out of the box, clean factory applied paint job for getting into weathering. I also think that if you wanted to re-letter or renumber a given piece, you've probably already done so. And I have a few videos in my library showing how to go about doing all of this. Now, as a side note, one can get some very effective results when painting an undecorated model, and I do have some videos for that. However, if you're getting started, it's a good idea, just stick with the factory painted models. This video is not about specific techniques, as each step has several different ways to get at it. For example, there are several different ways to fade or chip your models, and many of my videos cover those different ways that I do it. In addition, I've created a playlist for each of these subjects. This process is a starting point with lots of rooms for variation, improvisation as you get more comfortable with weathering. Several of my videos actually go off script, so to speak, as there are always exceptions to the rule. For example, a few of my start to finish videos see me moving some of the steps around as I need to. But this will get you started. So do you have a model that is just screaming to look more than just to be a hunk of plastic? Before reaching for the pastels or weathering chalks, we have some work to do first. And while materials are essential, I will talk about them briefly at the end of this video, but for the moment, the process is more critical because the process guides what techniques to use and therefore what materials you might need to get. So here it goes. You have a model that is waiting there to be weathered. Where do you start? Well, the first step isn't even at a hobby desk. Research is the very first thing that you need to do. Researching the prototype is an excellent way to get started in weathering. First, look for pictures of real life examples of the model in question. In particular, check out the Railroad Picture Archives or railpictures.net, or do a general Google search on the road number of the model that you have. Even if you don't find the exact road number match, you can find other locomotives or pieces of rolling stock that will help you see the patterns in weathering. Now, don't feel that you have to replicate the prototype, but prototype pictures can provide all kinds of inspiration and a goal to work towards. For example, you could find a rusty leased locomotive inspiring a worn out CSX warhorse. Also, rolling stock paint and weathering schemes evolve. Generally, the newer the picture, the more weathering that you're going to see. However, locomotives and rolling stock do sometimes get new paint jobs from time to time, so that's not always a good indicator. Weathering also reflects their environment. 
Think about the climate and the weather patterns that your trains pass through. Is it dry? Is it humid? Is it cold and snowy? Even if your layout is set in the country, has the car or locomotive passed through a major urban center? Chances are it probably has. All of these give clues as to what realistic weathering might be there. All of these give different clues as to what kind of weathering it might have. One key point to remember is that weathering tells a story. Every car or locomotive you see in a prototype picture has a story behind it. And the fading, the rust, and the chips all help tell that story. Now, once you've done the research, you can get to work on your model. Now, I talk about tools and paints in a little bit at the end of this video and throughout many of the, my existing videos, but I will also do a companion to this revised video by providing a starting kit video. But remember, this is about process, not technique. Step two is preparing your model for the work that you'll be doing on it. On rolling stock, this is usually removing the trucks and the wheel sets. For locomotives, it's more complicated. If possible, remove the shell and carefully take it apart into larger chunks like walkways, cabs, and the main body. Locomotives can be a bit more fiddly, but the principle is still the same. You may want to clean the model depending upon how many fingerprints it may have accumulated, and sometimes there's some oils from inside the mechanism that have gone onto the shell. And while this falls more into technique than process, between each step, I apply a clear coat, whether flat, satin, or gloss, depending upon what I'll be doing next. Usually my rule is flat before acrylics and gloss or satin before oils. It protects the work that you've just done and helps set up for the next step. Then of course, once all is said and done, you may wish to finish the model with a flat clear coat or something like that to protect it and reduce the shine. While I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, having a selection of clear coats on your paint rack is a very good idea. The first natural step in the weathering process is fading. This is what I do most of the time. Fading is what happens to paint on large objects when exposed to the sun and blown dust over time. The sun's UV rays fade the color of the paint, while blown dust can abrasively wear the paint away. And you can do this with various techniques, with whether using an airbrush or several different hand brush techniques using acrylic paints or oils. But the main idea is to make the paint and the markings look worn rather than factory fresh. I have several videos that feature fading techniques and many of them don't use an airbrush. Pin or detail washes. If you've ever looked at a full-size rail car, you'll notice that panel lines and details are much more distinct because of shadows, accumulated dirt, or the very depth of a panel or door. The first significant step is to use carefully applied washes to make these details pop out, giving the illusion of volume. And while it may not be obvious, if there were one essential step for making a model look realistic, this one would be it. Making details stand out help create the illusion of size and with it, realism. Remember that rail cars and locomotives are constantly in use, moving goods from one place to another. Workers climb all over them to load and unload them to make sure they're in good working order. And as good as the paint can be, no paint job can withstand daily abrasive contact over years of continuous use. The older the car or locomotive, the more likely there will be places where logos have worn away or paint has chipped down to the base metal. There are several different chipping techniques, but they fall into two major categories. The first is additive, in that the paint simulates chipping by adding it to the model. The second one is subtractive, in that the outer coat of paint is partially removed to show the color underneath. Salt chipping and the so-called hairspray technique are examples of the latter. Most of the time, additive techniques are what you're going to be using on a factory painted model, where the subtractive techniques can be very effective when painting and weathering an undecorated model. I have several videos in the chipping playlist that cover the subject on both sides. Rust tends to go hand in hand with chipping. Exposed metal from chips oxidizes, giving way to rust. However, rust comes in various forms and there are numerous techniques on how to handle it. Regardless of how and when you apply rust effects, rust should come after chipping, especially with streaks and stains. Like it or hate it, graffiti is a reality of modern railroading. Graffiti writers see these enormous rolling canvases as opportunities to display their art or simply scribble a tag. 
On the other hand, rail workers are often tasked with either painting over the graffiti in its entirety, or if they're short on paint, painting over enough so that the critical road and data markings can be reapplied. Graffiti can be applied either with pre-made decals or, if you want a real challenge, hand paint it yourself. On the other hand, patches are also an excellent way to cover up mistakes, and if you're not fond of graffiti, to show where the graffiti was but that has been since covered up. Lastly, no rail car or locomotive stays clean for long. Dust and dirt quickly build up as trains move through their environment. This step is the least reliant on prototype photos as the appearance of dust or dirt changes after each rainstorm or dust storm. Similarly, grease and fuel stains often come out over the dust in various places where it's recently been applied. And sometimes it even soaks right into the dirt itself and makes a nasty mess. So this is a reasonably reliable process to get you started, but it's only a guideline. Once you get some practice under your belt, there are times where improvising or switching things up happens in the process and that can give you a better result. For example, faded and worn out graffiti might mean taking a couple laps through the process, repeating a step, or moving the graffiti step before the fading or chipping step. Now, as a bonus, here are some materials that you should probably have on your weathering desk in order to get you started. Now, I'll be doing a follow-up video as this subject can be lengthy all on its own, but here's a short list. First and foremost, you will need a few sizes of small artist-style paintbrushes. And it's a good idea to have two sets of these brushes, one for working with acrylic or water-based paints, and another for working with oils or enamels. Now, don't be afraid to invest in some good quality brushes. You'll thank me later. Also, pick up a small set of triangular makeup sponges from your local pharmacy. You'll be making plenty of use for these for something called sponge chipping. Now, this subject deserves a whole video on its own. Acrylic paints are suitable for block colors, chips, and patches. And I recommend investing in some good quality hobby paints. Vallejo, Games Workshop, Privateer Press, Golden Acrylics, Ammo by Megan, AK Interactive are all excellent brands for acrylics, both paint on and airbrushing. Now, I would avoid craft paints as they don't have the pigment density or the fineness to do the job if you're just starting out. Now, some experts do use craft paints to great effect, but that's because they're well trained in it. So stick with the higher quality paints. Oils or enamels are great for weathering effects like pin washes or streaking effects. And like acrylics, go with some higher quality paints. Some places like Michael's have th a three-tiered system to classify their paints. So I would suggest go to the mid to higher grade paints and a selection of basic earth tones, black and white. I also highly recommend oil brushers from Ammo by Meg and Abitlung 502 oil paints and the various enamel products from both companies. These are top quality offerings and are made explicitly for weathering. And when working with oils or enamels, you will need odorless thinner as well. You will also want to have a selection of clear coats, whether acrylic or lacquer based. And again, this subject deserves a video on its own, so keep an eye out for that one coming out soon. Now a word on airbrushes. Airbrushes are part of the hobby and very much worth having. They aren't essential for weathering, but they do make some steps easier. For example, I have much more control when applying clear coats and I can use an airbrush rather than a spray can. However, spray cans can do in a pinch, but you need to be careful as you don't have the same kind of control as you might if you mix and spray. On the other hand, the cost of airbrushes has come down and I have recently reviewed a cordless airbrush that is a reasonable price and decent for some basic work and even some detailing that you might want to try out. Lastly, you need a space to put it all. Having a dedicated hobby desk is a good idea, but not essential. However, this process does get a bit messy, so arranging for a place in your space where you can do this work is a good idea. I will be putting together another video about kitting out your hobby space where I can get into a little bit more specifics. And there you have it, a revised basic process for weathering your cars and locomotives along with a few tips on materials to get you started. And regardless of what techniques that you may choose to use at each step, this order can help frame it and help you get the most out of your weathering projects. If you're interested in ideas for techniques to use, check out my other videos. 
So if you want more tips on how to get the most out of your weathering and painting projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. Also, check out my library of materials, both old and new, to help you on your weathering journey. And thank you so much for watching. Good luck, and may you keep on trying.